but right next to the peas, I've got these unbelievably gaudy and showy uh, rhubarb flowers, right? If your rhubarb are mature and healthy and you've got good soil and they've been in the ground for a number of years, um, they'll put out these massive uh, flowers. And a lot of people... Hi, it's Greg here with MaritimeGrinding.com. It's a beautiful, calm morning here and uh, I wanted to do a short video today talking about the idea, the notion that you need to grow uh, plants that attract pollinators in your garden. This is something I read about all the time in uh, you know garden blogs and, and uh, online uh, authors writing about this and I mean, sick. for some reason this is the thing that seems to happen in gardening where one writer will write an article about something that makes no sense to me and then another writer will write the same thing because that person got a lot of views then another writer will write the same thing, and another writer will write the same thing. And this is why I like to have authors like Robert Pavlis on my uh, podcast, because um, basically when he, when he reads something that doesn't make any sense to him, he'll uh, look to see if there's any actual evidence <laughs> that uh, that thing makes any sense. And I'm kind of wired the same way. Um, and a lot of times you don't even have to do uh, a good deal of... Uh, uh, inquiry to to ascertain whether uh, a claim is rubbish or not. Sometimes you can just think it through. Um, and the thing I want to talk about today is the notion that you need to grow certain plants in your garden to attract pollinators into your garden. Um, it's possible, here's the caveat, it's possible that there may be there's some instances where that is necessary. It's certainly not necessary here in my garden. I'm going to take you around and show you why. But I'm going to talk about this first. Um, Early in the season, when you're growing, I mean, you're not growing anything that needs to be pollinated for the most part. The only thing that needs to be pollinated early in the season for me, I guess, is uh, apple trees. Um, but there's uh, other trees uh, in the adjacent area that are flowering as well. So I've got uh, apple trees here and they need to be pollinated. Around the same time that they're in bloom, there's a, a number of things, the, the wild things kicking around that also are in bloom. There's dandelions, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of weeds. Uh, the colt's foot is blooming and also there's uh, trees that are almost look like apple trees I'll show you mine uh, like the choke cherry or the sand cherry or there's different kinds of things like that those things are in bloom too all those things are bringing in pollinators and they're all around right um, maybe 20 30 feet away sort of thing there's bees all over the place there's pollinators all over the place to a large extent in your garden you're just growing greens they don't need to be pollinated you don't you don't pollinate kale you don't pollinate lettuce you don't i mean when they go to seed eventually yes but you're growing them for their greens <laughs> they don't need to be pollinated to give you good greens in fact once they go to seed they're no good anymore from an eating point of view uh, later on in the season uh, when you actually need pollinators in your garden they're going to be around you know um, for instance right now so it's just past the, the summer solstice it's it's you know uh, very late in june and my peas have finally gone to bloom right so i actually need pollinators in my garden now because my peas need to be pollinated in order to make peas but there's other things in my garden that are in bloom as well there's all kinds of things in my garden that are in bloom different colors are showing up here and those things are drawing in the pollinators um, later on in the season when i need pollinators for my tomatoes and for my uh, squash and for my uh, peppers and eggplant and, and th things like that right uh, beans for instance right I'm gonna have all kinds of different plants in bloom at the same time with all kinds of different colors M moreover in the surrounding adjacent area around my garden just about every wild thing around that time of the season July August is going to be in bloom as well there's going to be flowers everywhere to the to, to that effect I guess I could say that when when my children were very young um, they wouldn't want to come in the garden in uh, late July August because there are so many bees out here the area would literally hum maybe I can capture that on camera this year the area would hum with bees it's all you could hear it sound like you're in an apiary there's so many around um, so all that's happening. Also, you've got other things that you don't uh, that put out fruit that you don't need. So I grow in my garden uh, a ridiculous amount of potatoes. Uh, I grow enough so that I really don't need to buy any. <laughs> right? uh, we eat potatoes all year. We run out around uh, April, and then we just take a little break from them. <laughs> 
because we, we eat them all the time. It's a weekly thing. We eat potatoes all year long because I grow so many. And at some point in April, we just, uh, you know, we just have rice and pasta and sort of enjoy that for a little while. And then uh, uh, the potatoes start uh, becoming available in July and we go back to eating potatoes all the time because they're free and they taste so good. Um, when you're growing potatoes in your garden and you're growing a lot of them, uh, there's potatoes growing everywhere here, uh, they put out flowers around the same time that your tomatoes and you know other things uh, need pollinators. So uh, there's plenty of things growing here uh, in my garden and also just wild in the surrounding area and all over the place that bring pollinators around. There's no need to invest time and energy into growing bee balm or uh, borage or you know I mean, there's a long list of oh top pollinators for your top five pollinators for your garden all that sort of stuff right uh, I think we read these articles and they make us feel good about ourselves or uh, I don't know you know what what effect this has on the psychology of the gardener um, and if you like growing those things and, and it makes you feel good to grow them sure fine my point is that you don't need to you don't need to grow those things to make the bees happy there's plenty going on and I mean, sure, I, my garden backs into a wild area and there's all kinds of things growing all over the place. But even if you were living in a suburb somewhere, two ducks flying overhead. Um, even if you're living in a suburb, good morning ducks. Uh, even if you're living in a suburb somewhere, I mean, if you go in a suburb, most people actually grow things that bees like. They grow flowers, they grow ornamentals. Most people don't grow vegetables. So there's flowers all over the place. The bees are happy, right? There's flowers all over the place. Everybody has a lawn. Uh, the lawn's going to have clover. The clover's going to have flowers. The lawn's going to have dandelions. The dandelion's going to have flowers, right? Um, so, I mean, there's, there's plenty of things for the bees to enjoy. Do you think growing like one or two bee balm plants in your garden is going to make any sort of net, is going to have any sort of net effect whatsoever? Um, I'm sure there's people that, oh, my tomatoes weren't good and then I got a bee balm plant and then I got more tomatoes. That could be because of your bee balm plant. It could be because of a wide range of other factors as well, right? It's just one possible explanation. Uh, that's not how you establish cause. Um, anyway, I thought I'd take you around my garden here and show you, even though it's so it's the end of June, uh, what's growing in my garden that needs to be pollinated and what is growing, what, what other flowers are just in the adjacent area that would draw them in, right? In, in addition to, I mean, the <laughs> Of course, the things that are growing in my garden that need to be pollinated, they're perfectly good at drawing in pollinators on their own. Um, but aside from those things, there's other things around here. I, I could really care less if they're pollinated, but the bees, there's plenty of them, there's plenty for them to be you know, interested in to draw them into this area. So let's go have a look. Right, so I've got a, a, a strawberry garden here. And the strawberries, I mean, it's very late in the year, and I moved these strawberries in, in October, so they're not looking too impressive, because it's a bit late to be moving strawberries. I moved my entire strawberry operation. <laughs> so um, anyway, they're putting out flowers. You can see the white flowers are very showy, right? These plants will be a lot bigger in the fall, but uh, they need to be pollinated. Here's another strawberry garden. I got a couple more of these. I'm not going to show all of them, but you know, these strawberries are coming in. They're putting out flowers. You can see the white flowers. They need to be pollinated. Now, right next to this strawberry bed, look at this pretty yellow flower. You know what this is? I don't know how many people know what this is, but this is a kale that I overwintered. Kind of looks like a broccoli in a sense, right? This is a kale that I overwintered in my cold frame. I cannot leave kale out in my garden in the winter. It just dies. I have to overwinter it in cold frame if I want it to go to seed. So this is a kale that I overwintered in a cold frame and then just jammed in with these uh, raspberries, and it's gone gone it's flowering right and these flowers will become uh, kale seeds so uh, you got these showy yellow flowers right right next to the the forest edge right those are definitely going to draw in bees and things like that there's no bees at them right now because it's early in the morning it's only 11 degrees celsius outside right now <laughs> so uh, it's still a bit cool for bees to be flying around they're probably hunkered down on underneath leaves and stuff over here we've got the uh, my peas, right? They're about, oh, three, four feet high now. And they're putting out flowers and they need to be pollinated. And of course they're perfectly good at drawing in pollinators on their own. A nice uh, stark contrast between the white flower and the green foliage. But right next to the peas, I've got these unbelievably gaudy and showy uh, rhubarb flowers, right? If your rhubarb are 
mature and healthy and you've got good soil and they've been on the ground for a number of years, um, they'll put out these massive uh, flowers. And a lot of people say to cut them. Um, I just sort of leave them, <laughs> I just leave them go. <laughs> but because uh, it's not like I need to, uh, I mean, they, you sh they say you should cut them off when they, when they send those out to uh, improve the yield of your rhubarb, but uh, I'm not really worried about my rhubarb yield. I've got so much rhubarb. <laughs> I can't even eat all this, right? I never do. I actually like using the leaves uh, as a mulch, right? <laughs> you put the leaves on the on the ground in your garden between your plants. It's a, a pretty low budget mulch <laughs> and, it, and it biodegrades just fine. And no, the leaves don't toxify your soil. Uh, here in this garden, I've got, uh, this is a, a garlic garden, but I, I moved some arugula into this garden midway through the year and the, the arugula, all those little white flowers, the arugula has gone to seed. So I decided to just let it go and uh, I'm going to try to save some of these arugula seeds and plant them uh, in the, uh, as a fall crop and, and next year as well. Um, but of course these are drawing in pollinators, right? So, and I actually do, just for those that are totally offended that I, I, I was uh, trashing uh, borage, here, here's a borage, borage plant right here. Um, borage is this funny plant that puts out these beautiful blue flowers, really striking color. Um, and I'm being, you know, I'm being crude when I say blue. It's probably, I'm sure someone would have a better word for the kind of blue it produces, but I just tend to say blue, red, green. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a green plant that has pretty blue flowers. Um, you can see there's a flower head forming there. And the leaves, they say, taste like a... Uh, cucumber, which they do, but they feel like thistles in your mouth, so um, I'm not a huge fan of uh, th this plant at all. I, I grew them once. Um, I grew borage one year um, just to see uh, what, what all the fuss was about. And if you ever grow borage once in your garden, you're going to have borage in your garden for the rest of your life. It just comes up all over the place. I probably uh, killed a, a couple dozen borage plants this spring as I noticed them come up. And I, I let a couple go in, in, in amongst these garlic just, just for fun uh, because I just I find the flowers really pretty. Um, but I didn't let them grow because I feel that I need them. But what do we got here? We got one. There's one over there. And here's another one. Look at this, I didn't even know this one. This one came up all on its own. This one actually grew here, it wasn't even moved. Wait, no, that's not borage. That's just some useless weed. <laughs> Outside my garden area, this is a perfect example. This is, I believe, what's called a sand cherry. And you can see it's putting out these little cherry type things. But this tree was, was fully in bloom around the same time my apple trees were in bloom. So of course it was drawing in pollinators. You know, the apple trees are, are just over there, not too far away, right? So, and these things grow wild all over the place. And, you know, there's, I imagine wherever, you're, wherever you are, there's something wild growing that uh, is gonna be in bloom when other things that you're growing are in bloom in your garden. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, not a problem, right? Not an issue. I've got, think of the amount of flowers a tree like this would put up. Right, they're growing in clusters almost like a cherry tree. Here's another Here's another one of those kale plants putting out a lot of foliage. One plant like this will give you enough seeds to last you years, <laughs> years and years. I had one go to seed about four or five years ago and I've been growing that kale ever since. And you get a lot of seeds out of a kale plant if you let it go to seed. Uh, you can also eat the seeds but uh, uh, I don't care for them. Um, here's a good example. So. You have the flower, and uh, and once the flower gets pollinated, it falls off and becomes this this little spike type thing. These will get longer, uh, almost like a small bean. They kind of look like a small bean, I guess. And they'll have it's a, it's a pod, and they'll have seeds in it. I'll show it later on in another video as it uh, develops. I just thought I'd show this little cluster of my apple tree. You can see that. It's done, it's that stage of pollination, at least as far as I can tell. And I can see by the swelling at the base of the flower head that these most likely have been pollinated. So something was able to find these apple trees and, uh, and pollinate them. And I'm guessing that there was all kinds of things flying around here doing that at that point in time. Right, this one really went crazy. You know, I was actually going to pull this tree out of the ground and throw it away. Because <laughs> it just looked so sick last year. 
and uh, I was going to plant another tree right here, another apple tree. I bought one, or I got one from uh, Vessi Seeds, and uh, at the last minute, I just didn't have the heart to kill it. I gave it one more year, and uh, it's really coming in strong. Uh, it's actually it's doing well. We'll see how it goes, but I mean, I don't see how this branch could possibly support this many apples. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another thing that needs pollination is these strawberries, right? So I got strawberries in my garden, or not strawberries, blueberries, right? They're coming in. But there's always something in bloom around, other things in bloom that, that'll attract the pollinators in addition to the, the plant's own ability to attract pollinators. You can see that these, um, this is a blueberry plant, and you can see that these have been pollinated. I mean, there's the the flowers are done. This is a slightly earlier plant, but the flowers are done, and there's a, a swelling at the base of the flower, and it appears to have been successfully pollinated by something. Remember, bees aren't the only thing that can pollinate, too. You can, ants will do that, and there's, I mean, there's all kinds of flying insects that like nectar, and they're all really good at pollinating things. Uh, and they don't even do it on purpose, they do it by accident, right? Over here I've got this uh, uh, lovage. Lovage is a perennial plant. It's a celery. Tastes like celery. Comes back every year. If you if you want to plant celery once and never have to plant celery again and have celery every time you need it, all during the garden season, uh, plant one lovage plant. Look at the size of this thing. It's like, it's a good uh, four, four feet high going on five feet. And uh, I've had comments from uh, other viewers on YouTube saying that their lovage is six feet high. Um, it doesn't matter. I mean, I'd be happy with this being three feet high because certainly one, you know, you, if you're cooking a dish and you, and you break off this much, you're going to be overwhelmed with um, <laughs> celery flavor, trust me. But the other thing this does is it puts out flowers, right? So you can see it's right here, it's putting out a, a seed head, right? Um, so that'll, that'll make a lot of flowers, it'll be very showy. And uh, that'll draw on pollinators later on in the season when other things need to be pollinated. It's not doing much for this this uh, adjacent apple tree, but you can tell by the, the state of these flowers that this apple tree managed just fine on its own. Right next to the apple tree, I've got all of these uh, year two asparagus. And uh, these asparagus, you, you don't... You don't harvest them for, uh, for eating in the second year. You wait till they're a good size. So you let them go, and of course, they're putting out flowers, right? Nice little pretty yellow flowers. And of course, those are going to draw pollinators into the garden. Uh, all along the back behind these cold frames, uh, I've got this wild rose growing here. This is a variety of rose that, that many people think uh, call her invasive. I can't remember the variety. It puts out these tiny little white flowers. And I actually planted this here. I saw it growing wild somewhere else, and I pulled it out of the ground, and the idea was to train it all along the fence. Because um, it's, it's a thorny kind of rose, and I thought it would just... I'd rather look at that than look at the fence. And uh, I thought it would uh, just make the place look more uh, <laughs> sort of natural and earthy and so on and so forth. Um, but also, you know, when this goes into bloom, probably uh, maybe in three weeks, give or take, um, it's, uh, there are all these pretty white flowers all over the place, and the smell, you can smell it, it's, it's a powerful smell. It smells like, uh, like a, kind of like old, you know, back in the old days when women wore perfume. <laughs> uh, kind of the kind of perfume a, a grandmother might wear, rose, rose water, you know, that sort of thing. It's a, it's a really nice, uh, uh, smell. It's actually, it smells identical to a uh, hand cream that my, my grandmother used to wear all the time, so it's almost like having her around when, when these are in bloom. It's just beautiful. Um, so, I mean, there's another thing that's, uh, you know, why would I put my energy, this, you know, this is so much more robust and easy to maintain, right? Of course, all along the edge of the garden here, I've got raspberries growing. Um, you know, in a, in a few weeks or a month, uh, they're going to be in bloom. They're going to draw on pollinators. And here I've got uh, uh, grapes growing, right? they're going to go into bloom. They're going to bring in pollinators, oh, uh, much later on in, in the season. Right, so there's things going into bloom all the time. Uh, finally, I, I would be remiss in not mentioning just the surrounding countryside. Right, so uh, my garden, this is sort of the edge of my property here. Uh, and I actually mow this maybe once every three weeks and use it as mulch. 
just come out here with my mower and with the bag on and mow up all these it's the same stuff that's over there just different random weeds and things and I, I use it like that um, but look what's going on in that meadow right there's um, buttercup there's uh, daisies there's uh, all kinds of different flowering there's those I don't know what that is Timothy the purple you can see over here right, it's, it's pretty purple uh, that's a flower from Timothy right um, it kind of looks like peas when it's growing but it is not it's a really annoying weed to have in the garden um, and there's another uh, I don't know what these are they kind of look like asters they make a purple flower when they come up but they're incredibly aggressive weed that I have in my on the edge of my garden they come in from everywhere anyway these people make a pretty uh, a pretty vibrant uh, purple flower and you can see they're all over the place here right so I mean there are an insane number of flowers and I don't I don't think the bees are particularly uh, I'm sure people might make these claims that they're partial to this or partial to that but I can tell you when I'm out here at the height of July um, I don't see any real pattern they're just going from colorful thing to colorful thing to colorful thing <laughs> I'm sure they have preferences um, but they seem to like just about everything that's out here <laughs> right so uh, yeah plenty of flowers around the garden just growing on their own doesn't require any work or energy on my part certainly doesn't require me spending money on uh, some kind of ornamental to have in my garden uh, even up, up here on the hill where i've got my pumpkins growing and they're doing okay uh, the giant pumpkin for those that have been anticipating waiting with bated breath to know what's happening uh, the giant pumpkin never germinated all three seeds just rotted in the ground even though the other varieties now those were a saved seed and of course these are ones I uh, I got from Vessi's uh, what's it called early giant I think is the variety uh, so I planted I can't remember what I another kind of pumpkin in there I can't remember what variety I guess we'll find out when it grows but it's not a giant pumpkin uh, anyway this uh, hillside is the the kind of soil my garden initially was there's a lot of people saying they they can't do this they can't do that because uh, their soil is rock and clay well I mean look at this this is rock and clay this is basically the soil my a good deal of my garden is built on uh, you know you, you can make that work I've talked about that lots of times but look there's stuff growing in this rock and clay right there's flowers right all kinds of different things just about everything that grows produces a flower and brings in pollinators so even on this sort of you know lousy soil berry barren <laughs> barren rock hill uh, there's flowering things and certainly down here I mean I just I just took a weed whacker to this very recently um, but there's a whole bunch of different flowering weeds that grow uh, here and they're always trying to grow in my garden down there so that's my point you don't need pollinators uh, of course it's your life and it's your garden if you like them plant them and grow them and enjoy um, but the idea that you need them to be a successful gardener, to have a successful vegetable garden, I think that's just foolish because there's so much going on in your garden to draw pollinators around. Uh, I think they're going to find their way into your garden and find their way into your plants uh, all on their own. The things you're growing are, are perfectly good at attracting pollinators to themselves. And if you're growing a wide variety of things, there's going to be so much going on. The place is going to be buzzing with activity. So I hope you like that content. And if you did, please like, share, subscribe. Check out my podcast, MaritimeGardening.com. And until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. Thanks for watching.